Okay, guys, hello. All right, ready for to jump in and do this week's lecture stuff. So we are talking about um, Coulomb's law and the electric field in this module, and we're going to jump right in. Okay, we're going to start by looking at some concepts that you have probably covered in other classes, and that is the concept of uh, the phenomenon of electrostatics. And electrostatics is basically the study of electric charges at rest. Now, while you um, may not know exactly what electrostatic is, what electrostatics is, um, you do know something about charges in general. So we're going to start just by talking about that. So some things that you already know about charges is that the fundamental unit of negative electric charge is the electron. And the fundamental unit of positive electric charge is the proton. Most matter has no net charge because there's an equal number of positives and negative charges that balance each other out. So most things have a neutral charge. Um, like charges do what? They repel. And opposite charges attract. These are things that you know, right? So an atom uh, becomes electrostatically charged if it gains or loses electrons. And we call that an ion. Remember that all the way back to chemistry? If electrons are lost, it will have an abundance of positive charges and then have an overall net positive charge. And if an atom gains electrons, then it will have an abundance of negative charges and have an overall net negative charge. So I'm going to start by doing a little experiment. It's the 1131 one that's in your book. I'm only going to do the um, tape part of it, and I may have you guys do the balloon part of it at home if you have a balloon. But I'm going to start by showing you what we're doing. So I have a couple of pieces of tape. You can't see them, but they're over here on a table. Oh no, i got to get it off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull them up real quick. I'm going to disappear for just a second. You'll hear it though. Okay, so I just pulled them off of the table. And what I'm going to do is now bring them together. And what you can see is that the pieces of tape are repelling each other. Why are they doing that? I'm not going to get too big, but you can see I'm not doing that. They are simply repelling each other. And that is because by ripping them off of the table that they were on, I have pulled off a few electrons and there's negative electrons on each of these pieces of tape. So when we bring them close to each other, they go away from each other. They repel each other. So that's what's happening there. So that is an, a really simple example of how electrostatic charge works. Okay, so that was the first part, or the second part maybe, of experiment 13.1. Okay, so um, the experiment gives us some other information, well, if we did the whole thing, about the reality of charges. And that is that the more charge there is, the stronger the repulsion or attraction will be. That's one thing. And also the closer the charges are to one another, the stronger the repulsion or attraction will be. So we know that some types of matter is going to readily gain or lose electrons, um, leaving them as ions. From your study in chemistry, you may remember that metals easily lose electrons. So we also can group matter into two basic groups regarding whether they or not uh, electric charge will readily flow through them. So if, if something, if electric charge is able to readily th flow through material, we call that substance a conductor. That's what a conductor is. It's a substance through which charge easily flows. Metals are an example of that. Um, if you have substances through which charge does not readily flow, we call that an insulator. So an insulator is simply a substance through which charge cannot flow. Plastics, ceramics, glass, those are things through which charge does not readily flow, okay? And there are some substances that don't fall into either one of those categories neatly. Um, some substances can allow current to flow, but it takes a lot of effort to accomplish that. And other substances only allow current to flow under certain conditions, and we would call those uh, substances semiconductors, okay? So, um, there, we, we've talked about other principles in the past or other laws um, that are constant in our world, right? We've talked about the law of mass conservation in chemistry. We've talked about other laws here, right? Well, we're going to talk about a law regarding charge, and that is the law of charge conservation. And that law simply says the net amount of electric charge in the universe is constant. So we can't, just like so many other things, we can't gain or lose charges entirely, right? They may move from one place to another, but they're not lost um, the amount of charge that exists in the universe is constant. So um, now I'm going to talk about a couple different ways that we can charge objects. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you by, on the board what I've drawn here. Okay, so the most common, the two biggest things, that, uh, the ways of charging things are charging through conduction and charging through induction. 
So we're going to walk through how that works, okay? So um, conduction is the, is the process of charging an object by allowing it to come into contact with another object, with a charged object, I should say that. Uh, charging an object by allowing it to come into contact with a charged object. Okay, this is my charged object right here. And you can tell it has an overall negative charge. Here's another substance. Now this doesn't have no charge at all. It's got equal numbers of positive and negative charges, right? So it's neutral. Um, what would, to conduct this, what we would do is we would take this object and put it over here in contact with our neutral object. Then what happens is we still have all the charges we had before, except now we've got an abundance, uh, we've got an excess rather of negative charges. Okay, so that gives this overall this this object an overall negative charge. Okay, um, that is charging by conduction, charging something by allowing a charged object to touch it, and basically allowing that extra charge to to flow into the neutral object. So always know that in the net charge through conduction will be the same as that of the charged object. In my example here, my charged object is negative. You can see over here I showed you that the overall charge of my object is also negative. So that's charging by conduction. Another way we can charge is through induction. Okay, so the, way, the definition of that is charging an object without direct contact between the object and an outside charged object. So let's talk for a minute about how that works. Okay, so same thing, we have a negatively charged object here, we have a neutral object here. So what happens, we've talked before about what happens uh, between like, uh, like charges. Like charges do what? They repel. So when I take this charged object and bring it close to, but not touching, this object, what happens is that the negative charge charges within this neutral object will move away from the negative charges of the charged object. And then the positive charges will stay over here and be closer. So it just separates the charges. Um, the idea of charging by conduction is that you then bring a neutral object in contact with, the thing, with this thing here. And what happens is these uh, some of the negative charges Will, or, well, negative because this is negative, right? The extra ones will flow down over here. And that leaves me then with an excess of positive charges in the, that's the final um, charge of the object. Is some of those negatives have flown away because there were several of them over here. They've gotten touched and it's gone down into this neutral object. And it leaves me with uh, a, an abundance of positive charges. So when we're charging by induction, the net charge of the object we're charging will have the opposite sign from the, uh, the charged object that we brought near to it but didn't touch it with, okay? So that is charging by induction, okay? Um, I wanna also talk to you about electrostatic charge and Coulomb's law. So I, I already mentioned that the, dis, the, the, the actual strength of the charges and the distance between the charges impacts the force that exerts, that, sorry, that exists between the two objects. Um, you also have to understand that this force only applies to objects that are at rest, and we would call that an electrostatic force. That is the force that exists between two charges at rest. Um, we actually have a, an equation for that. I'm gonna write it down for you. I'm gonna erase first here, though. Just so we can look at it real quick. All right, so the equation for Coulomb's law is this, F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. A, uh, K is a physical constant, Q1 and Q2 are the actual charges of the objects we're talking about, and R would be the radius between the two objects. We call the standard unit of charge the Coulomb in honor of scientist Charles Coulomb, who discovered this mathematical relationship. Um, and we, that is a big C. However, it's a very large charge and most of the time we're not gonna work with coulombs. Most of the time we're going to either work with millicoulombs, which we would write as uh, MC, or microcoulombs, which look like that, okay? So this is one, this is, uh, 
1 times 10 to the negative third coulombs. This is 1 times 1 times 10 to the negative sixth coulombs. <clears throat> so those are millicoulombs and microcoulombs. Um, and then also this k that we have here, the constant, is 9.0 times 10 to the ninth newtons meters squared per coulombs squared. Okay? So electrostatic force, just to wrap it up, electrostatic force is a force quantity, which means it is what kind of quantity? Scalar or vector? It's a force quantity, which means it is a vector quantity. So to determine the direction, we're going to think about the charges involved and logically determine the direction, and I'll show you an example of that in a problem. And then, although electrostatic force can be applied between objects at rest, the, the reality is that the value that, of the electrostatic force that's calculated will change. Why? Because as soon as those charged objects come into contact with each other, they're going to move one direction or another. So you have to know that any time you calculate an electrostatic force, um, you're, you've got an instantaneous electrostatic force you're changing because the reality is those charges would likely be moving and that would change the radius, not necessarily the strength, but it would change the radius um, of those things and you would have a different electrostatic force then. So just like uh, acceleration, just like velocity, what we're calculating is an instantaneous value for electrostatic force. So there you go. Uh, that's our lecture step. I'm going to make a video for problem five of the homework this week because I think that might be helpful. Okay.